Hey folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bonafide culture and politics TV talk show. Tonight, as you know, BC is the first province in Canada to decriminalize illicit drugs. But what exactly does decriminalization mean and how is that different from legalization? We'll get into it, but first, if someone you love is struggling with addiction, is it compassionate to force them into treatment? Does forced treatment even work? BC Premier David Eby says that involuntary treatment for addictions could cause more harm than good. But some of his critics are advocating for involuntary treatment, like our first guest, a former RCMP officer and Canadian Armed Forces officer, the newest BC Liberal MLA representing Surrey South. She is Eleanor Sturko. Eleanor. Hi. A pleasure to have you on the show. I'm so stoked to be here. Thank you. So you are in disagreement with David Eby. David Eby originally was flirting with this idea of involuntary treatment for people with addictions in certain cases. And now he's saying that, you know what, it actually might cause more harm than good. You're saying we should still look at this option. What um, is the case for involuntary treatment? I 100% uh, and Kevin Falcon's been clear that we need to look at it as an option. And really, I mean, it is, I think, something that takes a lot of political courage. Uh, it's disappointing to see David Eby walk back on, um, you know, sort of exploring that idea. I don't think it's as black and white as what people like to make it, particularly when we're talking about involuntary care. We already have elements of involuntary care within our Mental Health Act, mm -hmm. but there are parameters that a person has to meet before they can be brought into care um, involuntarily. And it has to have elements met also under the Charter of Rights. There's no arbitrary detention. So yes, I think there's still a lot of room for us to explore involuntary care. Um, and it has to be set up in a way that makes sure that people's best interests are kept in mind, but also that their rights are respected. So what are those parameters? Like when we talk about addiction, is it a daily user? Is it someone who's using three to five times a week? Is it a recreational user? What are the parameters do you think that need to be applied if putting someone and forcing them into treatment? Well, I think that if you look at what we have currently under the Mental Health Act, we have the ability for people to be certified by a doctor or a nurse practitioner if they're a danger to themselves or others um, as a result of a mental health issue or even as a result of psychosis that could be caused by the use of drugs or alcohol. But if we're going to expand what that scope would look like, we would definitely need to be consulting with psychiatrists, doctors, practitioners. And I think what what we're really talking about. I think people get this idea that when we talk about involuntary care, we're talking about a big bulldozer coming in and scooping up all the people. And <laughs> if you don't want to go to treatment, we're just automatically putting you there. And I don't think, you know, I think we should clarify. And I think it needs to be carefully defined so that people do know that we're talking about individuals who are a risk to themselves or others as a result, potentially, of their drug use. And I think, you know, I had a lot of experiences when I was on the street as a police officer where I saw people with tremendous wounds. Mm -hmm. um, um, people who were suffering from like prolapse rectums covered in feces. I mm. saw people with maggot infested wounds. So we're talking about people who have, as a result of a severe addiction, an illness, lost the ability to make um, a decision, you know, to come into care, to receive, to become stabilized, mm -hmm. um, that it's frankly very cruel of us not to help that person. I think in extreme cases, most people will say, sure, OK, mm -hmm. fair enough. Let's put those folks into treatment, even if it's against their will. Let's get them the health care that they need. But I guess the question becomes, where do you draw the line? And is there an objective line that can be drawn? Because there's also a difference between advocating for involuntary treatment and advocating for exploring involuntary treatment. So I'm trying to get where you are, yeah. where you stand. Are you I'm definitely an advocate for it, but okay. I think that more work does need to be done. So to be clear, yes, I think that there is room for doing this, but I think that there definitely needs to be more consultation with experts. And I think it's not a black and white issue in terms of who exactly will go. I think just like under the Mental Health Act, how there needs to be assessment, that will also have to be done because of course we want to make sure that there isn't unintentional consequences as the NDP likes to say and that we're not potentially doing more harm than good. But, you know, we have to also um, look at ways in which we're doing our very best to help people. And even under the Mental Health Act right now, there is an appeals ability because you mm. have the right to an, a lawyer if you 
you know, become um, apprehended under the Mental Health Act. It's the same as apprehended under any other criminal code offense. You have the right to speak to a lawyer to appeal that detention. And I would see something like that also being included in any other um, apprehensions or people being brought into involuntary care. We have these fail safes that go along with our Charter of Rights that can help make sure that people have the right to appeal that process. But I mean, I think we've seen it. I guess what I'm saying, though, is how can I, as a British Columbian, be on board with involuntary treatment or you know join you in your advocacy if I don't know where exactly you're drawing the line of, of what meets the criteria of someone that needs to be put into treatment? Well, I think that, honestly, we need to continue to educate people, to let them know. So, I mean, we've really just begun in terms of rolling out Kevin's platform, the BC Liberal platform on our addictions and recovery strategy, a recovery-oriented system of care. But I can tell you, like in my work with the BC Liberal Caucus and as the critic for addictions, mental health and recovery, you know, I've been um, talking a lot from both a lived experience as someone who's in recovery from alcohol, but also what I've seen on the front lines. And there are a lot of people who would you know deserve to come into care but we currently don't have any legislative means to to do that is there any other jurisdiction in the world that has a model of involuntary treatment that you look to and you go okay well, they're doing it right yeah well i'm not sure if it's what i would want to see adopted here but there certainly are other areas like in massachusetts they have some legislation that allows people their family members or individuals to go to the court and ask for a court order to bring someone into care okay. i think that you know that's one avenue you could look at but we also have the ability to, you know, re-examine our Mental Health Act to see if there are ways that we could expand it while still being able to allow for people, like I said, to appeal it. We don't want to arbitrarily detain people. We don't want, you know, it's against our <laughs> Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And, right. I, and that's not the intent of, of, you know, Kevin Falcon and the BC Liberals coming forward and talking about involuntary care. It really is in response to people who have felt utterly But you understand hopeless. that people will have will well, be defensive course. about, of course. you know, institutionalizing folks in, in what's not particularly an objective measure. Like there is some regard, uh, there is some subjectivity in terms of who gets forced into treatment or not, right? Well, you know, and that's why it's important to continue to consult medical experts, because if you think of it in those terms, our Mental Health Act and how we apprehend people and how people can become certified because they're determined to be a risk to themselves or others is mm -hmm. also subjective. And it's, sure. it's you know, has to be done by a health expert. But it's the spirit of that legislation, which is to take people who may be at risk of imminent, you know, harm to themselves or homicide and, right. and take them into care. And so the spirit of what we're trying to do, I think, matches that. It's the spirit of taking people who may have severe acquired brain injury, for example, from um, multiple overdoses, um, you know, having oxygen deprivation and taking people not to a point where they're forced in 16 months in treatment, but stabilizing people where they may have then that ability to make that decision for themselves. Uh, I think that, you know, um, just like in the Mental Health Act, it has to be reassessed after a certain number of days and hours, mm -hmm. and that an expert has to look at them again, a doctor has to do it again. Eleanor, we're running out of time oh, darn here, it. but no, <laughs> listen, I appreciate your time, and I know we're going to chat a little more on the podcast extension as well. Yeah, you got it. I appreciate it. your voice. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Oh, my pleasure. Absolutely. Folks, she is the newest BC Liberal MLA and a fast rising star in BC's political landscape. She's Eleanor Sturko. Now, after some business, what does BC's recent decriminalization of illicit drugs actually accomplish? We'll talk to some folks on the front line of BC's toxic drug supply crisis up next. <laughs> 